One of the most well-known American history books written in the last few decades is A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn, published in 1980. Zinn intends on writing about American history from the point of view of people who have been mistreated, weakened, or left out, rather than from the point of view of heroes and powerful people. He starts by talking about Christopher Columbus's discovery of the New World in 1492. Over the next hundred years, European explorers killed off whole Native American groups and brought back a lot of money for their home countries. In the early 1600s, English people came to North America. Soon after, they started a series of wars with the Native American groups, in which they used terrorist methods to show that they were in charge. Slavery was another important part of life in the early North American colonies. Settlers from England took African slaves and forced them to work for free. They also hired poor white people as indentured workers and made them work for free while they paid off their debts. Slaves often rose up against their white masters. In fact, many wealthy people in early colonial America were afraid that black slaves would join forces with poor whites to take over the colonies. Poor whites, Native Americans, and black slaves were kept apart by policies made by elites who had them manipulated to check upon one another. Around the end of the 18th century, the Founding Fathers planned a movement against the British. However, these people weren't really radical in how they saw the future. Instead, they were rich and powerful people who saw a way to get more powerful by using the working class against an outside enemy, Britain. American leaders came up with the idea of freedom and equality during the Revolutionary War. This idea is still one of the most important tools leaders use to control their people today. In the 1780s, the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution. It set up a strong central government so that the founders could protect their own land and interests. During the 18th and 19th centuries, American women from all classes and backgrounds stood up for their radicalism over and over again, even though their society was very sexist. In the early 1800s, it became more normal for women to go to college, and educated women became more involved in feminist issues. At the beginning of the 19th century, America became a major global power. It did this by first forcing Native Americans off their native lands, which was against deals that the American government had signed, and then by taking over Mexican land in the Southwest. In the 1840s, the Mexican-American War was a model for American nationalism. The American government would always find an unsound reason to start a war and then use that reason to get more land and resources. A lot of people remember the Civil War as the event that made the federal government step in and end slavery for good. But the federal government only did what it did because generations of bold Americans marched and used their right to ask the government to get it to do what they wanted. When the slaves were finally freed, the government didn't do much to help African Americans. In fact, the federal government did help African Americans in the South with money and troops in the years after the Civil War. But after 1876, the federal government stopped helping African Americans and started backing the needs of wealthy Southern businesspeople instead. In the second half of the 1800s, the federal government became more willing to work with businesses. It backed military actions, mostly in Latin America, that were meant to make American businesses stronger. Even so, many people were against the United States' strong and imperialist foreign policy. A lot of people worked together in unions in the 19th century. People who worked in the United States went on strike, protested in the streets, and asked for better pay and shorter working hours because the law and the government didn't even try to protect them. Because of this, the federal government repeatedly showed its support for business by sending troops to break up strikes and keep things running as normal.
When the government did help the average worker, it made sure to only make small, surface changes to the system. These changes were meant to make the people of the United States happy without really helping them. Workers turned to anarchism, socialism, and communism because they didn't like how the government treated them. These were ideas that disagreed with the capitalism idea that private businesses should run production and industry. The American government sent its poorest people to die in a war that had nothing to do with them during World War I. It also passed a set of rules that made it illegal for people to speak out against the war in any way. In fact, many socialist leaders at the time were jailed for saying what everyone already knew. World War I was an unfair, imperialist war. During the Great Depression, the federal government stuck to its policies of calm and peace. It passed some laws that helped workers, but it didn't do anything to really question capitalism or the American business class. In World War II, the United States said it was fighting for moral reasons only, to get rid of fascism in Europe. As Zinn says, the government fought in World War II because it thought it could make the United States the most powerful country in the world. After the war was over, the United States built relationships with world leaders that made it possible for its companies to trade freely with other countries. The war finished when the U.S. government dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, killing a huge number of people. This was mostly done to show that the U.S. was now the world's most powerful country. During the Cold War, which was the fight between the U.S. and the USSR, which was the other major nation at the time, the U.S. government tried to scare people by saying that the communists would take over the world. In the name of supporting democracy and fighting communism, the government often paid for coups and right-wing dictatorship around the world, which often got rid of freely elected socialist leaders. In fact, the establishment was just trying to keep American companies' business interests safe by making sure that world leaders would continue to work with them. America's extreme anger erupted in the 1960s. Aside from Native American rights, the people pushed for gay rights, women's rights, civil rights, environmental protection, and hundreds of other extreme populist causes. A lot of the time, when the people spoke out, the government responded with weak, surface-level changes that didn't get to the root of the problem. For instance, the government changed the way people voted to protect the rights of African Americans, but it did nothing about the racism and poverty that many black people had to deal with every day. America seemed to have less extremism in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. But a big reason for this was that the news quit covering protests by the people. At the same time, the American government, which went back and forth between Republican and Democratic leaders, stuck to a pretty steady political plan to cut back on welfare and raise the military budget. The United States defense budget kept going up even after the Cold War ended. A record number of Americans protested during the 1999 meeting of the World Trade Organization in Seattle. This showed that anarchism was still alive and well in the United States. The last part of the book talks about Zinn's War on Terror, in which the government sent troops to the Middle East to fight Muslim attackers. Although Zinn says it's too early to tell how Americans will respond to the war on terror, he does say that the American people need to decide if they support morals and justice or empire and military violence. If you have any suggestion of which book I should summarize, please let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe.